Hi everyone, um, it's been really great to be here and um, in some ways just I echo every sentiment of what you said <coughs> and every single struggle like I totally identify with it as well and it's just it's just so many common themes that kind of run through social care in the third sector. Um, I've worked for third sector my whole career for 20 years I've worked in social care um, and it was a conscious decision of mine to go into social care over nursing, over teaching, over social work because social care has that amazing quality where you get into the nitty gritty of people's lives um, and that's what I felt called to do and you'd probably find, especially within Crossreach as well I have to say is that when you're talking to staff it's, it's more than just a job, it's a calling that they feel that's placed, it's a vocation for them and I feel sometimes that that sentiment can sometimes be exploited um, within the workplace. Um, and so just because we do it because we have the heart for it doesn't mean that money doesn't matter to us. Um, and all through my time um, and all through my career, I've often heard the same thing. It's the same little quip, but there's so, it's like such a loaded statement where you hear people kind of laugh and say, just as well, we're no in it for the money. Um, and <laughs> I've said it myself before, you know, um, but there's a, there's a lot of truth behind that. I'm not in it for the money, but it doesn't mean that it's not important. And, you know, there's been a lot of different kind of things mentioned throughout today to even try and explain the reasoning behind why social care is so poorly regarded and poorly paid and that at the end of the day there actually is no excuse because we can't say that it's because we're not as qualified as others because within my team alone and we're a, we're a very small team we have a former physiotherapist we have a former police officer we have someone with an honors degree in psychology and we have someone with a master's in politics and social policy we are an educated bunch that know our stuff that supports statutory services as well. Um, so my project, I should have probably said, is um, Daisy Chain. We are based in uh, the Govan Hill area of Glasgow. If anybody knows the area of Govan Hill, you'll know it's one of the most culturally diverse communities in the whole of Scotland. And we are planted, our wee office is planted right in the centre of that community. Such a vibrant community, but such a complex community as well. And people come to us we have the health visitors coming to us, the social workers coming to us, the schools coming to us, other third sector organisations coming to us because they can't penetrate that community in the way that we do. And that's what social care is, that we get to the heart of communities, we get to the heart of people um, and the heart of their lives. And we do it in a way that so many statutory services cannot do. And I'm very much a big believer that if it wasn't for social care, our society would crumble you have the NHS, you have social work, you have all of these places, but it's the social care that underpin all of those things. And we are commissioned and we are asked, can you provide this for this wee family? Can you provide this um, for these people that are struggling? So the other thing worth mentioning as well is that it's children and families that I work with. So a lot of time when it, we're talking about the social care sector, it talks about older people's services or adult services. Um, and just like you were saying earlier, Mr. Big, it was we are a minority within a minority within a minority because the way children and families is regarded is that we are glorified babysitters, which is not the case because we are raising the next generation um, and we are, are investing in children to help them and stop them from developing the habits that can lead them into poverty, into destitution, and into hardship in later life. And we're also investing in the life of their parents as well, and helping them undo all the things that they struggle with, and all the different pitfalls that comes from their parenting journey as well. And so we are daily in the lives of these families and in this community to try and make it better. So with all that said, when you're working in a wee project like mine, 
Although we're part of Crossreach, which is a giant in social care, we are a very small wee project that relies on funding. Um, and we've managed to do so since um, 2010. It was actually yourself, Viv, that um, created Daisy Chain and planted us in Govan Hill to do our work. And at the beginning of the year, um, we received word that we, we didn't get our funding. And that accounts for 50% of our wee project. And we were thinking, how are we going to survive this? This is and it, when we were speaking to all of our stakeholders because we kicked into gear and we got everybody in. We got the health visitors in, we got the nurseries in, all the surrounding stakeholders in, and say, what do we do? And they were all shocked, saying, I can't believe that this has happened to you is because you do such an amazing work. And the funders <coughs> have all, all, also acknowledged over the years, you do such a great work, but sorry the money's just no longer there. And the staggering thing is, when we've been thinking about the future of our project, because we're still in a very precarious situation right now, so we would appreciate prayer for this, genuinely, but when we spoke to our staff, saying, you know, guys, this might all unravel, and I can't promise that you are going to have jobs, first thing that they did was they turned around and said, what's going to happen to the families? Once again, it's about the people that we care for. The families need us. The families need this project. And again, it speaks of the heart that these people have, that they are wanting to support the families first and foremost. And that's the conflict that lies within social services. I sit on the employee representative group within Crossreach, um, where we are talking about the different issues related to employment. And whenever we are approaching Crossreach to talk about pay, to talk about costings of things, they naturally will come back and say, well, if we change this, if we up this, this is going to be X amount for the organisation and X amount for this. And without, even though that's helpful and valuable to know this, we then feel that pressure to almost kind of compromise ourselves because we know that taking money away from the organisation or taking it away from service users and it shouldn't be that way. We shouldn't feel that we are having to then just say, right, it's okay if we don't get paid a lot because we know and we support people that are a whole lot more worse off. Um, and another example would be our disability services. We have a wonderful respite centre within Glasgow that provides short breaks for um, children with complex needs, and that's currently shut because of recruitment and retention. And so there are 60 families out there who have got absolutely nothing to fall back on, nowhere else to go, no other community, no other source of support, and they are all missing out right now. And it's because of staffing. It's not because it was a terrible service and it's not because we weren't providing adequate care, it's because there was no staff. <coughs> the problem with social care is that a lot of people see social care and roles within social care as a stepping stone to something better. And so we get a lot of people coming in who are maybe students that are studying to become a nurse or an OT or a teacher. And so they're going to do this to build up a bit of experience and then they go off to the well-paid jobs. So we can't keep our staff. We spend huge amounts of money training up staff and investing in the staff. And then they go off to jobs where they can get a permanent contract, where it's full-time hours and not relief contracts or annualised hours or any of these things. And also, um, better pay in conditions, let's face it. And so we have lost so many staff. There's staff that I still grieve over losing because they were so <laughs> remarkable and so incredible at what they were doing and they're gone because, and it, they didn't want to go because they loved what they do, did, but they says we need full-time work. When we've asked people, why, why did you choose not to apply for this post? They'll say, because it's a temporary contract. Temporary contract's all we can offer because we're funded. And so in three years, we don't know where we're going to be. Um, and so it's a very insecure kind of place to be as well. And so it's really hard when even I don't know how long I'm going to have my job for. And it's so funny when we were talking about, you know, your, yourself, when we were talking about the, your daughter getting the job in nursing and things like that. I have lost count 
of the amount of times people have said to me, you love kids, why don't you become a teacher? The holidays are so much better, so much better paid. Why don't you become a social worker? Because you, you do so much of that kind of thing already. Um, and so it's almost that people are trying to kind of offer me careers advice that I'd be a lot better off somewhere else. And because it's true, because when families are struggling, our experience is when families are struggling, they are not going to go to the big regional office of their social work department. They're going to go to their wee community organisation in the corner. And that's what we get on a daily basis. Families rocking up with all sorts of different things. And so my staff need to be skilled and they need to be prepared for whatever comes to their door because in any given day you can't predict it. And so we have families that have come to our door saying, you need to go and help me get my clothes out of the house because I'm fleeing domestic abuse from my partner. We need to go now. We've had families coming to us saying, I have just been made homeless and all my stuff is sitting on the street because I've been evicted and my children don't have a home to go to. And who is it that steps up? It's social care. And it, we need to step up and provide something and put something in place while the statutory services get their stuff together and go through all the processes and all the red tape. But it's us that will source the buggies, it's us that will source the clothes, it's us that will, you know, help when families' lives are falling apart, given all of this emotional support. Yesterday I was at a conference um, at Shacklide University and it was all about um, addressing child poverty. Um, and so Scottish Government have pledged to try and eradicate um, child poverty by 2030. And, um, the closing remarks were given by um, Bruce Adamson, who is the Children and Young Persons Commissioner. Until the end of this week, he's wrapping up his job at the same time as the moderator. And um, in his closing remarks, he was saying, what needs to happen in order to eliminate child poverty or to tackle it in a way that's meaningful? Um, and one of the contributors says, you need to value their workforce. You need to be paying them better because it's these people that are going in with all their skills, all their knowledge, that are investing in these young lives, that are raising the next generation. We are providing the foundations of society and what we do. We are not glorified babysitters. And so until we feel more valued as staff, nothing's ever going to change. And if, you know, my final example would be if you, um, if you are a mother that has a child with a disability or a child with complex needs and you are entrusting your, the life of your wee child into a service, a short break service or even a day service for staff members and it could be said for older people services as well to be going into a service where they're going to be cared for where they're going to be loved, where they're going to be protected. You want someone who is skilled, who is qualified, and who is well paid in order to do that. Because the weight of responsibility that are on our shoulders as social care workers is huge. Because in a lot of these services, we are required to do moving and handling. We are required to deal with challenging behaviour. And we are required to deal with very complex health needs as well, providing administering medication and all sorts. And if any of this goes wrong, it's weighty, you know. Um, and so for all of these reasons, I feel that more needs to be done. And yeah, I, I would say don't stop at the £12. You know, if we can, let's just campaign for as, for as much as we can. And it's not to say that we are any more important. It's just to ask for what's fair, so thank you very much.